and welcome back to the book and life podcast today we are going to have a brand new book guest on whether they're an author an editor a producer you'll never quite know so you're in for one hell of a ride but today i just have to uh do the adverts and then i'll get us straight into that most important conversation and as as we do every week um i'm going to read the shadow which is part of the Time Guardian series, and this is book four from Marianne Curley. The battle is over, the war is won. The prophecy complete, but life can't just pick up where it left off for Ethan, struggling to cope with tragic loss. At odds with friends in the guard, he finds himself adrift, jumping in shadows and sensing someone who can't possibly be there. Blaming herself for the goddess Athena's death, Giselle swears revenge to fullify the immortal's plan for world domination, but Giselle hadn't planned on love, and that leaves her with an unbearable choice. Should she follow her heart or the strings of a goddess short on praise but high on expectation? Who continues to pull her from the grave? As the guard and the order battles through the past and into an impossible future, darkness looks around every corner. The fight for the world's survival rests with just one. Is it friend or foe who stands in the shadow? And just a reminder that The Price of Freedom by Rosemary Aiken, sorry, Rosemary Rowan, um, is being donated to the Ukraine cri- refugee crisis. And here's the blurb for her book. It's uh, one of her Roman British crime series, which was written under her maiden name. All editions can be found online where all books are sold, even her agents donating her commission. Sorry, I don't have the blurb for that, but uh, that's that's what she's doing. And now, without further ado, let's get you to the guests. So guys, I promised you a bestseller. I promised you a genius of her craft, and she is here today to share that knowledge with you. I am so lucky and honored to know this woman and to be able to call her a colleague and friend. So without further ado, please everybody welcome Sarah Mallory. Hello. Thank you for that great introduction. (laughs) It's funny, everybody's always dead surprised at my introductions, and I'm like, I wonder why. <laughs> no, it's it's lovely. We all we all love to be to be praised and have compliments. You know how lovely that is. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I, I think because I also understand the nerves as authors when we mm. kind of go into doing this. You know, there's that kind of you get the butterflies, but then you're also kind of dreading answering the same questions over and over again. Uh-huh. And that's kind of where I love this because it it's just a conversation. It's not, you know, and I get to go back and edit it if I don't like certain <laughs> things or I can yeah. smooth it out or do whatever yeah. it is I need to do. Um, so that that's why I love this show. And I, I feel like that's why I'm seeing an uptake in everybody who listens. You know, we get people from Texas who listen and people from Russia and all over the world it's just it's crazy just how far this has gone and and we are coming up to the one year anniversary may 1st no wow. yeah may 1st it was uh-huh. i started this last year and um i i think i've i've released over 62 episodes so far so you know it's been been a bit crazier than i expected and, and it's lasted longer than i thought i thought everybody would I would struggle to get guests on, and uh-huh. then I, I thought that nobody would be interested in coming on. So, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Good. So we're here today to talk about the night she met the Duke. Why don't you tell us about that, and we'll take it from there. Well, it's um, a Regency romance, which is uh, possibly my my favourite genre. Uh, and it really, it does what it says on the tin. It, it starts with the night she met the Duke. Um, Prudence is living in Bath. Uh, she's had 
some sadness in her life. She lost her, her brother um, and hasn't quite got over it. And she's living a very quiet life in Bath. And some cruel person in the past said that she's as dull as her name, which, which hurt at the time. Um, and it still rankles. And uh, the book begins with one evening, late one night, when she goes down to the basement kitchen because she thinks uh, a, a drunken servant has left the door unlocked and finds a dishevelled stranger sitting at the kitchen table, which is a bit of a shock. And since the only um, man-servant is, is drunk and completely unconscious, she has to work out how to handle this and obviously she's not strong enough to throw the guy out. And it just turns out that he is uh, Garrick, um, Duke of Heartland, who is reaching a crisis in his life uh, and she helps him through it. I don't want to give too much of the story away. Um, but she, he's... he's. No, you've, you've done amazing. I... <laughs> well, he's not very happy. She... She talks to him, she helps him on his way, thinks they'll never meet again, but then uh, she gets invited to London with her aunt. She's a companion to her aunt. And I've set the whole thing around 1814, and it, it was quite a year of celebrations for Britain. There was the uh, centenary of George III, uh, of the Hanoverians, rather, the, the Hanoverians coming to the throne. Yeah. Um, so they, they were going to celebrate their hundred years later in, the, later in the year. But before that, in June, um, the Allied sovereigns came to Britain. The Prince of Wales, Prince Regent, invited them over because everyone thought Napoleon was defeated. So they had some celebrations. Yeah. A bit premature, shall we say. Um, but it, it meant one of the things which is quite important for anyone who writes Regency is that the Tsar came over and made the waltz popular. And you know in, in lots and lots yeah. of Regency stories you have people waltzing. So that was is one of the, the points in the book. And most of it takes place during the celebrations at the various parties uh, and events that were going on in London at the time. And there's a bit of a mystery put into it. Um, Prue is, she likes to help people. She, she is really a champion of the underdog and anyone who is, um, if, if she sees injustice, she wants to, to change it. And although Garrick is a duke, he is, there is something in his past which brings up a lot of injustice towards him he's um, and so she feels she has to defend him which he's not too happy about he thinks he'd just like to let it go and, and get on with his life in peace and quiet but on the other hand he then has to defend her because she's determined that rights to right some wrongs so and that's that's basically the whole story without giving any spoilers. Yeah. It does it does sound fantastic. I I really enjoyed writing it. It's very it, you can't really just have a boy meets girl. You've got to have more to it than that. And the characters have to have something going on in their life. Um and yeah. uh Garrick is quite a complicated character as as is Prue in her way. Uh and it's bringing them to get together and having quite a lot of fun along the way with it. So. I like that, and I think with Regency, you do need to have that little bit extra. You can't just have boy meets girl. Not not nowadays anyway, because I think with all the way that media is and the content we're seeing is and the way everything's moving, that audiences just expect that little bit more to every story they read so that mm. it makes them feel satisfied when they've read it. Um, and I think you're very talented at taking those extra little details and, and then planting them to make a story just really seem like it comes to life. Well, I, I do like to have a, 
an accurate historical background. I like to weave my my romances and my stories into into a backdrop that is reasonably historically accurate. It's um, it's difficult to to get everything perfect and to make it right because it's a fantasy land for a start. There aren't there weren't that many dukes in England, yeah. but but they're incredibly popular yeah. with readers. So. Um, we do our best. I agree with that. And I, th I think, you know, anybody who doesn't live in Britain necessarily doesn't know that we didn't have a lot of dukes or <laughs> earls. So I think it's kind of, it's interesting to me. I always have a little giggle because my mum was like, well, we don't have that many dukes. And, mm. and, you know, everyone in America thinks that everybody's related to a duke in some way. Mm. Um, I always find that, that very, very fascinating to see that kind of reaction from people. Mm. So where, where did the inspiration for this particular book come from? I think it started with the idea of, um, of Prue as a, a woman who, she was single, she's about 24 I, I believe, or 25, so she's really on the shelf, she doesn't expect to to meet anyone and and marry and she's she's above average height so that sort of restricts her her choices a little bit she's not uh, not classically beautiful so she's she's going to have to have something um to to bring her to the attention of this man and also i wanted to do something about the woman basically the woman saving the man um, you know, it's it's very often yeah, we have the hero. Done in, in Regency. It's it's very difficult in Regency because women their their role in society was a little bit more cramped, um, even than in in sort of medieval times. I believe they, in, by by Regency we were heading towards the uh, the little woman not getting involved in anything. Uh, women have always been strong, and lots of them have always done lots and lots of wonderful achievements but then it's not always recognised in society so the perception is that uh, women were just chattels and didn't do anything and a lot of them were so it's it, it, it's finding that fine line between yeah. reality and, and writing a fantasy that people can actually believe in, can lose themselves in for a few hours so See, I agree with that because for so many decades, everyone just assumed it was men from Vikings that was going out in boats and fishing and raiding and trading and doing all these things. Whereas what they didn't know was there was a special group of women that they kept who could go into these towns and villages and not raise an eye, but were trained to defend themselves, to raid, to, to do all this sort of stuff. And I think that's incredible because it kind of shows that there was some gender, there was a gender equality in the tribes. It was just on who you were, like it was by who you were born to, it sort of dictated your life almost. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's lovely when you see that portrayal of a strong woman in history because it just reminds people that, you know that women weren't always uh, put in the corner, so to speak. No. No. Uh, I know uh, there are a lot of incredibly strong women did... Um, they were in the shadows. You know, they, they may have been working hard, but they, they just remained in their men's shadow. But they didn't mean that they weren't important. Whether the men would have done quite so well without them is possibly a, something we could debate at some stage. <laughs> so... But it's, yeah, it, it is difficult I think we writing. definitely could debate that, yeah. <laughs> That's one for another day, definitely. So what was the best part of writing this for you? Um, the best part of writing it is always uh, coming up with the, the premise and then starting the story. Once once I've thought it all through, I never, I never plot anything. I always know... You're gonna, I'm going to have a happy ending. I know who's going to be happy at the end. Um, but apart yeah. from that, I never plan anything along the way. 
but by the time I've, I reach the end, by the time I know what happens at the end, I'm beginning to get bored with the story and moving on to the next one. So the starting of it is always the, the best bit. And then getting lost in the characters when they have great scenes together and they're, you know, when they're sparking off one another or there's uh, an adventure scene or something. Um, yeah, it, it, it sort of, as long as it flows, that's great. Um, but as I say, once, once I've done it, once the story's written and told, that's it. I, you know, it's done for me. So, having said yeah, that, I do reread them occasionally, so. So what was the hardest part for you with writing this one? Uh, oh, I, that's that's a difficult one. Um, I'm not really sure if there was really a, a difficult part. I, I, the characters just seemed to know where they were going in this one. Um, maybe, I think so possibly... On, so to speak. Sorry? So you were hanging on as, as they, the story ran away, you know, you were kind of like clinging on as if you were on yes. a roller coaster? Yes, I, I think towards the end it was working out the timings to make sure that um, everything fitted the backstory uh, of things that had happened um, had to fit in with uh, Napoleonic war history. And also, towards the end, things get a bit exciting, and you've got to have all the characters in the right place at the right time. And that's, that's always a little bit complicated. You've got to make sure that the story flows to get them there. Um, but it's, yeah, so it, it's sort of maybe the mechanics of it in, in places was a little bit uh, tricky, but it worked. And... I've just because it was it's a long time since I wrote it, I've just reread it again and I must admit I I do quite like this story. It's uh, it seems to rattle along quite fast. Sometimes so. that is the, the best part when you reread it. Yeah, like mm. when you reread it and it flows really well and there's you know, you can feel that fun that you had when you wrote it coming yes. through. That that to me is always the best moment, I think. Yes, yeah, I, I think sometimes when you've finished it and then you've edited it and then you've revised it, maybe more than once, sometimes the spark seems to go out of it, so it's good if you can put it away. Uh, or even if after it's published, if it's a while since you wrote it and you've, you've moved on to other things, if you can come to it with fresh eyes and you see it a bit more, a bit more subjectively, no, objectively. Get that right. Yeah, you can always <laughs> see it as a reader would see it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult but to do that if you've written something, but we try. Yeah, we, I, I think we all try because, you know, as authors, we we kind of come up with these stories and we create them. And and unfortunately, as a case like uh, of them being like our children, then we have to, mm. you know go through this process of creating them and editing them and, and being so involved with it that when it's out there in the world it's almost like we're we nervously await to see how it does and it you know all our books are kind of like our children in that way because mm. we are very understanding of you know we all know what each other go through for writing it it's never an easy journey it's never quite yeah. simple so you know I think that's a great thing to share because we all have a piece of ourselves out there in these books, and I think I think that's that's what makes a story really sing. If you can place a piece of yourself in there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's it. It is. Um, I think you have to write with from the heart. Uh, and if if you don't, I think sometimes that if people can write books and and they haven't got that spark. It's because they're not writing. Possibly whether it's whether they love what they're writing or they're they're just doing it by rote. I don't know, but uh, I think it shows if someone's really enjoying their writing. Yeah, it can show. 
Oh, I, I think that as well. So, what books have you read recently that you could, you know, which you which you could say has stuck with you the most? That has really kind of left a lasting mark on you so far this year. Um. Well, I think I, I've said to you before when I'm when I'm actually working on a book, I try to avoid romance, reading romance and reading historicals because I I don't like to. I don't want it to affect the voice, my own voice. Um, but recently, I have it, I've recently revisited a Rosamond Pilcher, the, the Shell Seekers, um, which is quite a large book. Uh, you know, it's it's quite a thick saga-ish tome, and there's lots of characters in it. But it's incredibly well written. I read it almost as a, a lesson in writing a novel. It's very good. Um, so I, yeah. I, I, although it's been around for years, um, I still find that a, a good book. Um, I've also read uh, an Anne Cleves. I, I like all her Shetland series very much. And I found one recently, I don't think it's a new one, but it's called The Sleeping and the Dead, which is a, more of a psychological thriller. Uh, with a mystery from 1972 and someone who was a, a woman who was a girl at the time who was involved and bringing in characters and I think Cleves is very good at um, at setting up characters and getting into their their psyche and just making them slightly more complicated and possibly yeah, more realistic yeah. um, and so that was a really good one and then the most recent one I've read, which is a, uh, a cosy crime, it's by a colleague of mine, Liz Fielding, who is a very, very good Mills and Boone contemporary romance writer. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Oh, okay. <coughs> well, I was going to say Fiona... Uh, excuse me about this. Fiona Collins <coughs> Into the Dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my throat's a bit dry. I don't no, talk very much. Like she did. Um... <coughs> <laughs> yeah. That book was was very good because it it really was contemporary strong women mm. with quite a, tw a a twist to it. But it's also a bit of a spin off from her mm -hmm. Bone Collector series, which I think is yeah. quite interesting because the boy that was in her Bone Collection um, is now grown up, and it's kind mm. of following on from that, following on his story in a way, and I, I think that's that's good because I, I really wanted to know what happened to one of the boys that was in the Bone Collector, um, but I always like Fiona when it comes to crime, just because mm. she's such, her voice is such a good voice, yes. um, so yeah, I, I, I keep coming back to her, that one because I, I don't know why, but that one just felt really good when I read it yeah. and I still think about that one back and forth and I was saying to you before we started I read The Elopement by Tracy Reese, which we have the review on the Book and Life podcast and that one was actually just a very quick Catherine Cookson like story mm. that flowed really really well and I've been lucky enough, she sent me two of her other ones, which is The House of Silver Mill and The Rose Garden, uh, which I'm looking forward to getting into at some point. Um, but yeah, those those are sort of ones that are sort of sticking out for me right now. And then uh, in a week or two, I'll be starting yours, so that'll be, that'll be even more fun for me. Oh, good, good. Well, Liz Fielding's... Um She's recently turned to, to cosy crime from her romance, and I read the. I was lucky enough to have a, a proof copy of the um, oh, okay. uh, of her new book, which is called Mo. I think it, it's out at the end, the beginning of May, maybe the end of April, um, and it's called Murder Among the Roses, and it's it. it I really enjoyed it. You can yeah. tell she's honed her craft well. Writing for Mills and Boone, you know the the story flows, the characters are there, the dialogue is there, um, and it's it's a great cosy crime with a touch of romance as well, which you just you know is never a bad thing. 
it's never a bad thing and I, I really kind of find myself in awe of people who can do cozy romances because mm -hmm. it's not like the cozy crime romances because it's not an area that I've been able to do and I would have loved to have been a Melvin Bird author I think I would have done okay there but mm -hmm. uh, I could never get their formula to fit my kind of storytelling so yeah I, I mean I, I, I have yeah. I, have I think that that's endless respect for people like that. Well, it's I I think that's the problem. There isn't really a formula. It's just a, a style of storytelling. If you presumably I have it because yeah. they're still publishing me. But I was writing those books before I that style before I wrote for Mills and Boone. Um, and yeah. I don't think I haven't changed my style really much to suit them, as long as. I can write books yeah. that I like that they will publish, then we seem to be doing okay. So I'm not sure. It's very difficult. I don't really think there is a formula except, um, you know, it's, it, it's just if your style suits their way of working. And there are so many different styles of writing that obviously not everyone's going to fit into that. Um, maybe some can yeah. change their style more too. I mean, too. I've, I've come close. I came close twice to get inside mm -hmm. um, and I felt very kind of honored with that um, but I just I just didn't make the cut um, mm. but you know I'm lucky enough that I'm signed with Tai Hayaharan pu mm -hmm. publishing here in the UK and I look forward to doing the prolific contract that I'm doing with them um, but yeah, my funnily enough, it was medical romance that I came very close to getting published with them. Really? So, yeah. 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 <laughs> that I, is, I that came close, and then the editor, I, I had done the rewrites for, she left. And then I huh. sent in the rewrites I'd done for this new editor. Uh, and uh, they were looking for a Grey's Anatomy kind of story. And I, uh -huh. I'd come up with this Grey's Anatomy kind of story, and then they turned to me and said, you know, the only thing that they didn't like or the, the only ways, the reason they couldn't take it was because of the power dynamic between the two, between the hero uh -huh. and heroine. And unfortunately, my story didn't work any other way. And no. uh, so it, it, it didn't go ahead. But uh, yeah, I, I, I came close. Maybe one day I, I might be what they're looking for. But uh, yeah, so far, maybe. no luck. <laughs> well, <it's laughs> But you are, I mean, you're, you're doing well, you've got a, plenty to go at for a while, so, <coughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't think yeah. you're going to be yeah, three, lacking next in three work. Years is, uh, I don't need to look for another one, so. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing, and I, I look forward to sharing um, my work with you through my uh. new publisher. I think, uh, I think you'll definitely enjoy it, um, especially with the different kinds of novels that I'm able to do. There's no... It's weird because I, I always wanted a contract where I could write whatever I wanted and, and not feel constricted by one genre or one mm -hmm. pigeonhole. And th this really allows me to do that. So if I wanted to do a crime novel, I can do a crime novel. If I want to do YA, I can do YA. Um, so yeah, it, it feels like a very good good fit for me. Yes, I'm, it I'm never it. really sticking to one genre anymore. <laughs> yeah. So is there, out of like all the books that you've read, do you have one author that you go back to all the time? Um, I think I think my my comfort read these days is Millie Johnson, um, who is uh, okay. a Yorkshire lass, Barnsley lass, and her books are a mixture. They, they have some humour in them, but it's, sometimes it's a bit of a dark humour. She writes quite, quite gritty modern romances um, about real, real working class people generally um, in very different jobs, yeah. usually around, uh, all based around one area of, of Yorkshire. Um, and I maybe it's because we spent such a long time living in Yorkshire, but I love her books, and I can go back and reread them and find something new in them every time. And it's it tends to be about people. That, that's the quality of a great writer. Yeah, she is. She's incredibly funny, uh, 
incredibly supportive of other writers as well. Um, and I just just love all her books. She's she's changed slightly from the early Is ones I find this. Hmm? Is there any books that you're looking forward to coming out? Like, is there any books that, from authors that you know is coming and you're like, I have to get these these ones? Um, I don't think so. I will, I will buy the next Millie Johnson when it comes out. I will, I will probably buy the hardback, depending on what's on my to-be-read list. I try and hang on a bit, but generally I, I buy it when it comes out. Um... But, um, no, I don't, I, I think apart from Millie, I don't think now there's anyone, there's, there's several writers that I, I like, um, Anne Cleves, I, I enjoyed the Shetland series more than some of her others, uh, but I, I think she's a fine writer, whatever she does, uh, it's just the Shetland one, maybe it's because yeah. I've got this thing about the highlands and the islands that, uh, Shetland really... It, you know, I really like those that series. So. Yeah, Sheldon's got a way of getting into people's bloodstreams and not quite letting go. Yeah, I can speak yeah. for from experience on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, we, um, I have heard her talk. I, she I came, mean, growing up in Shetland is so magical. So. Yeah, well, and I know Cleves isn't from Shetland, but she did live there for a while or spent some time there. And I have heard her speak about her books and, uh, you know, the, the crime elements and the forensic elements that she puts into them. And she's an incredibly good writer, but she did get, for me, she seemed to get into the, into the skin of the Shetlanders. Because um, her books do seem quite, not quite so door as some Highland writers that I know. Uh, but she does seem to get into the characters yeah. and understand uh, the the family system and the it's not exactly a clan system, but uh, about tradition um, and loyalties and the landscape. Yeah, tradition's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I th I think it was her man that was her connection to Shetland, and I think that when she lost him. Mm. That was the reason that she stopped writing the series. Mm. Well, I know she was. She did some um, some work there, didn't she? On the uh, on one of the uh, about the bird sanctuaries or something. I I can't quite remember now, but I know there was a connection there. Yeah. Which kept her there, and yeah. But, uh, yeah, I know that when the bird sanctuary burnt down, she was very devastated about it because mm. that bird shell like that that shelter that people use to go see the birds and watch the birds was really the best income for that island and mm. when they lost it it meant that there was nowhere for people to stay so they couldn't really spend time on the island and it really mm. affected that local island's um economy and it was good to see her kind of raise that point you know um yes but yeah i think she's a great advocate for shetland and i think this this makes it even more interesting, you know, to see where she's going to go next. I don't think she'll ever write about Shetland again because of her connection with her husband. But uh -huh. I think it's it's lovely that she she was able to to give the island a bit of notoriety, even if it wasn't quite what the locals would have liked. But she really did spark the the crime writers of Shetland uh, with the Shetland Noir. You know, it, yes. I would kind of peg as being her biggest achievement. Um, and there's so many best-selling names that go up there now to support the Shetland crime series is, um, and the Shetland crime writers. I think it's, it's, it's very good. And I was actually lucky enough that uh, one of the teachers from Bray had um, mentored me a little bit when I was a teenager and probably is the reason that I went into publishing. So, you know, it's... It's great. I think it's, it's lovely to have that kind of connection with everybody. So, in the writing side of things, what would you say is being 
the most difficult thing for you to kind of overcome or learn or adapt to? Oh, um, it's, it's, I'm not, you know, I, the writing bit, I, I'm a storyteller. I am, I'm not a literary author at all. Uh, I like, I like to tell stories and write stories. Um, so possibly managing to actually have the patience to write a whole story out is one of the things that is can be a little bit difficult you know the, the story races ahead in my in my mind and the reader sometimes needs a bit more information than than possibly i you know i, I might race, race on towards the end of something and you think hang on you've got to take the reader with you so you need to fill in characters and um even secondary characters to give them slightly more flesh um but i I don't know. I I find the whole writing thing is it. It's almost a mystery. It's quite magical the way a, a story evolves, and um, and sometimes they almost write themselves, and they always seem to come out at, at about the right length and yeah, the right place as well, which is great. So. so, what's been the easiest part for you? Like, what would you say has been? the easiest part of your journey so far? The easiest part so far has been coming up with the ideas. I think the hardest part is finding enough time to write them all down. Right. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of ideas. I know that <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Yeah, lots and lots of ideas um, have started, but then you've got to you've got to finish them and you've got to follow through and get the whole thing finished and written and polished up so um, I have quite a quite a few in the pipeline or in the drawer that, that possibly need writing one or two started one or two finished even that could possibly do with coming out and being looked at again so yeah coming up with stories it, so there's what always would be a what your if best advice? my best advice to anyone what would be your yeah, your best advice for new writers coming into it, like in regards to time management and kind of self care and balancing the two. Uh, um, the time management thing, I I now tend to have a um, a timer. I, I I'm at the stage now when I I know when my deadline is going to be. Uh, so I, I allow myself, and I'm very lucky because I can, I can spend all day at it if I want to, but I set the timer for four hours and it's four hours or a thousand words. Sometimes, you know, if, if I'm not writing the actual story, it can be four hours of research, but I try and do that daily. Um, and it's surprising how long four hours will take you if you have interruptions, you know, if, if someone comes to the door or there's a telephone call, uh, those four hours can stretch all day. Uh, sometimes they go very yeah, quickly, so or you I can get a couple of thousand it. written in a in a couple of hours. But it's it it's actually sitting down and getting started and sitting there and you there's no other way around it. You've got to type word after word. So. And it's yeah, your story. I agree with that. Setting yourself goals. Yes. And yeah. following through with those goals and knowing where you're going. Yeah. Is and don't the only get, way to do this business. There's not. Yeah. Don't get it's distracted. Not really a good rule book. There's plenty of books out there about it, but you need yeah. to just keep going. And it's it's very easy to get distracted and to think, oh, there's something else I'd rather write. Sometimes. It's irresistible, and you have to go with that. But mostly, you should. Well, I think you should maybe make a few notes, put it into a file, put it aside, and get on and finish what you're doing. Um, it's the, the the old. I think there's an old journalist saying about don't get it right, get it written. Once it's written down, once the the first story, the first draft is written down, you can go and polish it, edit it, make the changes. But until it's written. 
Um, you have you have nothing to sell, nothing to sell to anybody, so even yourself. And, and also, I think believing in what you're writing too, um, because I think a lot of people will start writing it and then question whether it will make money or whether it will do well, and that kind of puts everything back. In you know, yeah. they'll, they'll then go away and they'll try something else. And I think just having faith to go you know to see it through all the way to the end and know that okay if it doesn't sell it doesn't sell but you've at least written that story and you never know yeah. when it might be something that somebody will I, want to pick up and somebody will want to do something and with. I, yes I, I think it's um, it, it's a bigger problem for, for new writers and sometimes they don't realise that I, as far as I know, every, every writer I know is always anxious about the book she's writing and the one she just finished. We all have moments of doubt about whether it's good and whether it's going to sell or whether we're going to be able to sell it. It doesn't matter whether you've written one book or a hundred. Um, you still worry. They're, like you said earlier, they're all your children and you still worry about them. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that every time I sit down to to write the ending of a series, and I, I hate that. That's the hardest part for me, is, is walking away from characters for good. Because I want, that's what makes me a good series writer, because I never want to say goodbye. Um, <laughs> that's always the hardest part for me. Do you, do yeah. you find that when you're, when you're done with the story, and you know you've got to say goodbye to the characters? Do you find that difficult? Well, it, it is, but I'm, I'm fairly lucky that uh, with Mills and Boone, very often I take one of the characters and write, uh, write another book, which so it then becomes a series. With um, this, the, the night they met the Duke, there is the Duke's best friend, Jack Callater, and I've just, really, I've just finished his book, um, which, it, which Mills and Boone are going to publish. I think it's under the title um, Something in the Brooding Lord. I can't remember what it is now. But, uh, oh, not Cinderella. Wow, oh, it might be Cinderella and the Brooding Lord. Or Beauty and the Brooding Lord. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm so so focused on the night she met so. the Duke now that the other one is, is put aside in my brain into a separate <laughs> compartment. But the, there is a second one now in the series, so um, so I get to see the characters. Prue and Garrick will come back and make a few uh, a few appearances in the next one as well, which is great. I love that being able to show them a few years down the line. So. I think that's good as well because it, it's almost like you're not seeing a proper goodbye because you know that they might appear in a later episode or in a later book and it kind of gives you that that you know like you're not saying goodbye you never know when they're going to come come back again and I think yeah. that's, that's that's amazing I wish I could get into that point myself but a lot of the <laughs> characters I write tend to not to want to go away <laughs> um, or you know never think their story's done so I think that's why I end up with such long series is because yeah. the, the characters for me is it's not just them that you're listening to and you're, you're getting to know. It's their world. I always have to focus on making yeah. an entire universe. And um, I well, think people find yeah. it very difficult to walk away from the universe as well. So, yes. um, yeah. Jack Callater has just popped into my mind and told me that it's snowbound with the brooding lord. He's just remembered it. So. Luckily, he's his, being his story... Being his story, he's very keen that people should know. <laughs> yes, I, I get that with mine as well. Like, I struggled over the title of my new one for the, the Susan Family series. And oh. it's Layla's sort of spin-off. And I was like, well, do I call it just Layla? Do I call it Layla's World? And I kind of hummed and paid on it for a year. I went back and forth about oh. it for a year. And just one night I was I was having a completely unrelated dream and she walked straight in as if she was this uh, teacher in a fell mood slamming the door and she turned to me and she goes it will be my Layla's world just like how Marie's got hers <laughs> and I was like okay then 
That's yeah, Ito. Lovely. Like, the, you know, yeah. I'd been going back and forth with my co author for a year, and then she just comes in and just yeah. lays down the law. So, um, well, the yeah. Mills and Boone do have um, continuing the series on. Yeah, Mills and Boone do have a, a marketing team who, who work on the title. So, they, I think they have some sort of system where they, they pick out all the most popular keywords, the things that their readers are looking for. So they tend to, they yes. tend to decide on the titles for us. But uh, um, you know, it's <coughs> it tends See, to I, be I basically wish I had what that because I get stuck yeah. on titles all the time. Um, I always start off with what I think the title should be, and then by the time the book's finished, I'm like, no, this doesn't, this doesn't yeah. tie with it, you know, and I end up pulling my hair out trying to think of what it really should be. Um, yes. So I, I like I would have loved the idea of having somebody say, well, but, you know, this is this is the title it has to be. I think that would take the pressure um, off me just a little bit. It it does a bit, yeah. I mean, I always have a working title for my books, um, but it, whether that yeah. ends up as the real one is it it usually doesn't. But it's good to have something when you're actually working on it. It does. It, it's, I think it's very helpful. Um, and because the way that my series works is you get one from Marie, you get one from Amber, you get one from Charlie, and then you get one from Layla. And the fact that it rotates through the characters so that you're getting everybody's stories, but you could read their stories separately as separate series, but uh. they can all come together to create this overall tapestry, this overall picture. Um, uh. I, that wasn't planned, that just kind of happened, but I like that idea of being able to sort of make it like a jigsaw puzzle where you put them all together and and you get the overall sort of vision of the world and, the, and none of my characters are perfect. Most of the time people always hate one of them. Sometimes it's the lead, <coughs> to be honest, but mm. I like I like the exploding flaws, I think that makes yeah. it... Well, humans aren't perfect, so... Yeah. Yeah, if, if they were perfect, they'd be cardboard cutouts, wouldn't they? So you don't want that. Exactly, yeah. Because we all do things that, we all make mistakes, and we all put our trousers on at one, you know, one leg at a time. But I think we, we all have our unique quirks and traits, and I like to show that off in mine. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's, it's been lovely having you on. You've made it to the end. Uh, we're now going to just talk about life and, and what you know what you do to balance your, your work life and your life, uh -huh. uh, which I always think is the hardest part of being an author is, is not just time management, but making time for family and friends and remembering to cut uh -huh. your hair, which I always forget. Um, so yeah, how, what do you do to de-stress once you're kind of done with your writing and your editing? What's your way of just going... Um, sometimes, depending on the weather, going for a, going for a long walk can be uh, is great to de-stress that way. Um, or playing the piano, or doing just just sometimes doing housework, catching up. When I finish a book, by the time I finish, there's usually quite a lot of housework that needs doing. So um, that can be quite I'm therapeutic in yep. taking your mind off the book so. <laughs> and also the, the office at that stage always my study needs tidying um, because things as you come towards the end everything has to stop so you finish the book and then you look around and you find you everything is in chaos and it has to be tidied before I can start the next book so uh, a, a, a really a friend of mine, Wendy Robertson, who's uh, a writer from um, County Durham, and she said years ago, one of the things that she was telling new writers is about priorities, family first, then the book, then everything else. And I tend to agree with her. That's about how I do things. Uh, the family, the family are the who come yeah. first, but they are all, mine are all grown up now, so... I do get quite a lot of time to myself for writing and I can fit the children in afterwards. Um, but uh, I'm sometimes just sitting and watching something on TV 
Because I'm not looking at words. I, uh, I, I love listening yeah. to music yeah. as well. Um, but if you're, if you're looking at words and using words all day, sometimes you don't want to go away and pick up a book immediately. You want to, you want to just sit and chill out with friends or you know, just sit and watch something. Uh, you need a break wildlife. in between. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you do. Or we are very lucky here. We, uh, the house has a view of the sea, so sometimes just taking a cup of tea into the lounge and just looking at the water is, is quite, re yeah, it's quite restful. I must admit, I loved that when I was uh, staying at my parents. They, they looked straight onto this cove in Shetland and oh. they always get orcas that go through there. And oh, yeah, taking a cup of coffee and sitting with my mother or my father and just, mm. you know, watching what was going on in the ocean was always a nice thing to do when we were staying up, nice. in, up in the islands. Um, yes. But now I live in, in Sterling, so I, I always have crows flying around and my cat's <laughs> going bizarre because there's so many birds and, oh. and things for them to see. Yeah. So, yeah. But I'm, you know, one of the things that makes me slow down and appreciate my journey is my illness. I have rheumatoid, uh, idiopathic rheumatoid arthritis, which means mm -hmm. um, my condition's got great ways of slowing me down. And I sometimes get no yeah. say in the math. Um, so what would be the thing that kind of reminds you to, you know, just take a step back, smell the roses and, and appreciate, you know, what you've accomplished? Um, I think actually it's, it, it's gratitude for the fact that I have been able to write, um, that I, I have been able to give some time to the writing and it's, it, when it was younger, the, it had to take a back seat to the family. Uh, but now I feel incredibly lucky that we've moved to Scotland, which is the Highlands, a beautiful part of the world. And I, I just feel that I'm incredibly lucky to be here and I feel very grateful for it and it's it would be it would be wrong of me not to appreciate the landscape and where we live and we try and uh, sort of fit in with the local community and help out I do um, help to run the West Coast Arts which is the uh, it, it's a charity that brings performing arts plays and not so much dance but plays and music to the to Westeros, um, which is not easy to get touring companies to perform this in such remote areas, but that helps to it just gives your mind another focus. So yeah, uh, but there's I, I must admit that's it's something that Shetland also struggles with mm. because we are so rural, and because it's you know it's a fourteen hour boat trip or it's a two yeah. to three hour plane ride that mm. you know they, they look at it as being too expensive so I, I like the fact that the Shetland Council and the arts community there will raise money to bring up you know actors and um, all these different people to teach the teenagers and the kids and the adults to have these workshops mm. to help them improve things that they love and to, to learn about the industries and stuff like that um and I love the fact that there's so much writer support up there too that, you know, it's after my own art. I, I was a huge part of the, the arts industry in Shetland for so long, promoting it, performing for them, you know, doing whatever it was I could do. So I, I know the, the draw to that. Um, uh. And I feel like I learned a lot from my time on stage and from watching, you know, my, my, great -grand my grandmother and my great grandmother loved the pantos there. And uh, yeah. my grandmother Nan would, would take me every year. Um, and the last one we actually went to see together was My Fair Lady, which actually turned out to be my favourite um, musical that I ever got to see with her. Um, yes. So yeah, I, I, I love it. I, I feel like it's, it's you kind of walk away inspired, you know? Uh -huh. um, I would walk away inspired, but I also walk away with the itch to get back on stage myself, <laughs> so... <laughs> you know, I don't know if that was quite what she was uh, intending when she used to take me, but um, yeah, I, I, I adored it.
And I think that the reason that I write now is because of my time walking the stage um, mm. and doing that. Well, it's been absolutely lovely to have you on, and as the listeners will know, we are going to have a spotlight review for your book, which will be coming up in the coming weeks, and uh, it, it's just been an absolute honour to have you, and I can't wait to have you back, and we can talk more about sort of what life is like as a Mills and Boone author, and we'll talk a little bit more about the different things that you've learned over the years working there, and diving into a lot more about how you pick you know where you're going to go in history for writing these particular novels but it has been truly wonderful to have you on the show today and uh, I hope we can have you back soon thank you Crystal it's been a real pleasure I've enjoyed it thank you